In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. My beloved, it's also that wonderful time uh, where, of the month where we gather together and we discuss together the different questions that you have submitted to us throughout the, the last couple of months. Um, and it's this wonderful period where we gather together, where people can participate live, where you can send your questions directly through the form um, of the Facebook chat. And it's a wonderful opportunity for us to connect. So again, we're super happy to be hosting these live Q&As on a monthly basis. We already have a few questions that have been submitted to us over the past that we're going to try to go through right now as we speak. And at the same time, while people are slowly trickling in, while people are participating, uh, we'll give them a chance to be able to submit their questions live and we'll answer those as they come in. Uh, just a reminder, now that we have the platform on Coptic Orthodox Answers, where we have the website, the Facebook page, the YouTube channel, all of these different mediums, we have been receiving a lot of questions. We have also set up different platforms for everyone to be able to benefit. As you know, we have the Apostolic Answers uh, weekly videos that come out where we attempt to answer some hard-hitting questions in under 10 minutes. We also have the um, the deep dive videos that were recently launched and we started off with an amazing commentary on the Gospel of St. John that is led by Father Gabriel. And we also have the Words of Wisdom series, which is entire purpose is for us to be able to share with you a lot of the incredible Orthodox teaching that is found within the Coptic Orthodox Church that many of our, uh, our, our beloved fathers across the globe are, uh, are teaching. And so we give you snippets, these little two or three minute videos that are there to inspire, that are there to help um, give you a little bit of words of wisdom. And if you take a look in the comments of those videos, you'll actually have the link for the full sermon if ever you would like to read all of it. So again, all of these things are done in the spirit of wanting to share the wealth and the beauty of the Coptic Orthodox faith. And so without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump right in and we'll start answering some of the questions that have been submitted online. So the first question that I would like to answer today is a question that comes in from um, a youth here in the United States, uh, in North America. And the person is asking the following, uh, are your sins still forgiven if you ask God for repentance um, in your prayers? but you don't necessarily go to a father of confession. So, my beloved, there's a reason why it is that we believe in the mysteries. And there's a reason why it is that we believe that the church was established by Christ through the apostles in making it very clear that we go to God for everything that we need. We go to him for the forgiveness of our sins, for the healing of our souls. We go to him for the adoption into the kingdom. We go for, to him for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But the Lord grants us the gifts of the mysteries through the priesthood through holy orders. And this is extremely important because some people have a very false misconception. Some people believe that we go to the priest to confess to him, but that's not actually true. The true mystery behind confession is that we go to confess to God, but before a priest. The same way that nobody would say, I can go ahead and baptize my own child, and they would do it at home in their bathtub, for instance. Or nobody would tell their children, come, bring your fiancé to me, I will pray the crowning ceremony, I will open Coptic Reader, I will read the words of the rites of the ceremony, and I will pray the liturgy, and I will ask the Holy Spirit to come down upon you. No one would do that. We would go to the church to receive that mystery. The same way that nobody would stay home and tell his children, come gather around the table, break bread, offer wine, and think to himself that just simply by speaking the words, that this is what calls down the Holy Spirit to change the bread into the body of the Lord and the wine and the water into the precious blood. Because we believe that the Lord works through those that he has called to the ministry, and so also we adopt that same mentality when it comes to confession. You have to understand that the reason why we go to the priest, there's several reasons, by the way, but among them, obviously, is to be able to receive the gift of grace directly from the Lord. And the honest to God truth is that if I really did believe that God is capable of hearing me and seeing me and being with me when I confess in the privacy of my own home, then I should have also believed that when I sinned. But the mere fact that I am capable of sinning secretly is because I don't truly believe in the presence of God. If, if God was truly present with me in the room and I truly believed that he was, wouldn't my behavior change? Wouldn't my thoughts change? Wouldn't my habits be completely transformed? The same way that imagine if you wish that you were driving a clergy member home. Would you use the same words? Would you keep the same playlist in the car? Would you, would you have the same types of conversations? Would you do the same actions? Or forget that. What, what if my father or my mother walked into my bedroom? What, wouldn't, wouldn't that create an, an opportunity for me to, to look around and to see what's fitting, what's not fitting, what's right, what's wrong? 
if these kind of people inspire a sense of awe in me where I want to live up to a certain standard because they're present, how much more should I feel that towards the presence of God? Especially if I believe in a third hour litany. Especially if I believe in the heavenly king that is present everywhere and fills all things. And so if I truly did believe that, I wouldn't sin as much as I do right now. And so the honest to God truth is that confession also creates this sense of contrition within me. It allows me to be able to externalize the sin that has been hanging in within me and it's been causing me this great anguish. It's been causing me this anxiety, this weight that is within me. I have to externalize it. And the fact that I continue to carry the guilt even though I've asked God to forgive me is a clear fact that confession really does have a therapeutic aspect to it. And after I've confessed it, and after I've received counsel from my spiritual father, and then afterwards what he will do is that he will take his hand, which is the hand of Christ, and he will place it on my head. And in the process, I receive the absolution from the mouth of Christ. I receive the absolution from the Lord himself. This is when I receive the forgiveness of sins. I beg you, my beloved, please, do not let things such as embarrassment or awkwardness get in the way of your repentance. Do not let them get in the way of you receiving the grace that you need to be able to be liberated from your sin. What sin does, it really is a bond that attaches us to it. We see it as slavery. And the Lord wants to loosen us from those shackles. He wants to loosen us and give us the freedom that we need to be able to pursue Him and to pursue Him lovingly and aggressively, to run after Him with all of our might. But we can't do that as long as we're shackled. We can't do that. And so in the absolution prayer, we say the words, Lord, we, we ask the Lord that He may loosen the bonds of sins. And that's exactly what we want. We want Him to loose them. And so don't ever let the fact that you're confessing to a mere man such as myself get in the way of that. Go to the Lord, confess your sins, and then ask the priest to be able to pray the absolution for you. And regardless of whatever embarrassment or fear or anxiety you might have, I guarantee you, the moment you release, the moment you externalize, the moment you receive that absolution, it is exactly as if a burden has been lifted. I urge you to run after that grace. I urge you not to let these thoughts of I can do it on my own or what if Abuna judges me or what if he thinks negatively of me. Nobody, those, th those, don't, those things don't matter. They really don't matter. In the grand scheme of things, the grace of the absolution and the lifting of my sins, the forgiveness of my sins, the healing of my soul is exactly what I should be pursuing. So I urge you, please pursue that. Um, it's wonderful to see that a few people have already joined on. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Gigi is asking, what is the subject, dear father? Uh, actually, Gigi, the, the subject is whatever you guys make it. So please feel free to submit your questions. And based on the questions that come in, we'll be happy to, uh, we'll be happy to go ahead and answer whatever questions you guys submit. We have a question here from Elvin that says the following. Uh, Father, is there any spiritual strategy which can be used to make sure your thoughts are in line with God's uh, with each moment? Well, I wish there was a very easy solution to this. And let me tell you, uh, Elvin, this is probably one of the most difficult struggles that we go through in the Christian life. Because this is not something that you do once and then after that it becomes routine. It's actually a struggle that we have to fight with every single day of our lives. The first thing that we want to keep in mind is that you have a lot more control over your thoughts than you might think. And the reason that I say that is because many people don't realize the average human being has anywhere between 30 to 40,000 thoughts every single day. So when you think about this, this is a lot of thoughts. Because if I asked you uh, yesterday, what were some of the thoughts that you had? You might be able to name 40, 50, 60, say 100 of them. But we don't remember the 40,000 thoughts that have crossed our mind throughout the day. The, the, the mere fact that you guys are listening to this right now, this live Q&A, I'm sure that you're, you're staring at your phone or your tablet or your computer or whatever it may be. There might be noise around you. Your mind is processing all of these things. Even as I stare at the laptop right now, I can see behind it my cup of water. I can see my phone in the corner. I can see the window that's right next to me and there's things moving outside. My mind is processing this, but I am choosing to ignore those things because I have chosen to put my focus here. Now, I want you to keep this in mind for just a moment, because even though there's a lot of things that are happening around me, even though there's a lot of thoughts that are being processed, the mind is capable of filtering all of them, all of them out because I have told my mind, this is where my focus will be. I want you to realize that we can actually train the mind to do the same thing. Whenever there are specific thoughts that usually captivates us, whenever there are thoughts that distract us, thoughts that we indulge in, those are the kind of thoughts that we have to get better at literally telling them I'm not interested. And the moment we address that thought by saying, I don't want you, the brain is capable 
of completely classifying it and setting it aside. But like a fly that needs to be shooed away, it comes back. And when it does come back, we have to be patient. We have to continue shooing it away, not letting it land on us and dwelling on us. You know, the early church, especially the Desert Fathers, they used to speak of this idea of how it is that thoughts are very much like birds that fly over your head. They say you cannot stop a bird from flying over your head, but you must prevent it from landing on your shoulder and from building a nest. This is exactly what we have to struggle with. So to answer your question, Alvin, if a thought comes to us, that we know is not from the will of God. A thought of judgment, a thought of resentment, a thought of anger, a thought of lust, a thought of gluttony, whatever that thought may be, we have a responsibility to shoo it away. And part of the shooing process is to simply say, I'm not interested. And to redirect your focus elsewhere. The same way, and again, I use this as an example, I'm ignoring what's happening outside the window and I'm telling my mind, this is where you have to be focused. And so my mind is focused on this. The idea is to tell ourselves, what do we want to prioritize? What do we want to focus on? And if we can align the mind to those things that are holy, then we will participate in those things that are holy and in the process be sanctified. But if we allow our mind to participate on those things that are debauched, those things that are fallen, the things that are sinful, then naturally we will inherit that as well. Sin will make its way within us. And we don't want that. And so to answer the question, how do we make sure that our thoughts are in line with God's? It begins with knowing what God's things are and saying to ourselves, this is what I want. So think of the following. The Lord is always telling us that He wants us to be sanctified. The Lord wants us to be edified. The Lord wants us to be one with Him. He wants us to participate in the life of His Son. And so identify those things as your priorities in the things that you read, in the things that you watch, in the music that you listen to in the conversations that you have, in how you spend your free time, and whatever your hobbies may be, in the conversations you have with your friends and with your spouse and with your children, allow God to be a part of all of those things. The more we involve God in the littlest of things, the greater chance we have of Him constantly consuming our thoughts and our mind. And it becomes a relationship that we eagerly want to run to every free moment that we have. I want you to think of a a couple, for instance, that might be newly engaged, that are super excited about getting to know each other, where they're in the process of discovering who the other person is and knowing every intimate detail about them. Those people are eager to call each other at the end of the day. They're eager to want to spend as much time with each other. They don't want to hang up when it comes to the end of the night. And all of these things happen. Why? Because they love being in each other's presence. We want to be consumed with God in the same way. We are truly pursuing a relationship with Him. We want Him to occupy our mind. We want Him to have a big place in our heart. We want to be eager to finish the workday, to go home in that private place, to stand alone, to stand before Him and to be with Him, to speak to Him, even if it means spending that time in absolute silence. But regardless of that, this can only happen if I choose to offer myself entirely to Him, my thoughts my mind, my soul, my heart, my actions, my habits, my workplace, my family, all of those things have to be offered to him. So Alvin, I hope that this helps just a little bit, but I want you to know that it's going to be a lifetime struggle. I want you to know that it's a decision that we have to make every day. It's not one of those habits that are established after 21 repetitions. You know how they say a habit can be formed if you repeat it 21 consecutive days? I want to tell you that our will being aligned to God's is something that is a decision that has to be made every single moment of our lives. Every single moment of our lives, we have to tell the Lord, Lord, I want you to rule. I want you to, to reign in my heart. And so this is a decision that has to constantly be made. We cannot be discouraged because in the end, we know that it's worthwhile. Whatever we do here for 60, 70, 80 years will transfer into eternity. And that's what we hope for. We hope that we will be able to spend eternity with him. Thank you, Elvin Habib, for the question. Uh, my beloved, I'm just encouraging you, if there are any questions, so please feel free to submit them. We'll answer them as we go. If anybody else wants to break the ice, by all means, please go ahead and do that. In the meantime, uh, I'll go ahead and answer some other questions that have been sent in um, through different mediums that we collect answers on. So there's a question that says, how do I stop being lazy? I say God is my priority, but I don't find time to talk to Him. Do I need to believe in God more? Or am I simply lazy? How do I get out of this? Well, I think it really is a mix of both, right? And I want to encourage the person who's an, who sent in this question to know that you are far from being the only person who's struggling with this. It's not necessarily a lack of belief in God. What it is, it's 
uh, forgive me for being so blunt, it, it's, it could very well be a lack of love, right? And the reason that I say this is because at the end of the day, we keep talking about how it is that we don't have time. But that's not true. That's really not true. I mean, my beloved, I, I, it doesn't matter what you do. You could be a surgeon. You could be a full-time stay-at-home mom. You could be a priest. You could be a bishop. You could be a, an executive at a big corporation. At the end of the day, you have time for whatever you prioritize. The number of hours in a day will always remain the same. What you decide to invest that time in really does depend on you. Nobody's forcing you to spend that time in anything else. We make time for social media. We make time to go to the gym. We make time for each other. We make time to eat. We make time to sleep. I want to tell you that if I really prioritize God in my life, I would be okay with sleeping one half hour less every single day. I mean, I wake up early and lose sleep for other things in my life, don't I? If there's an important event that I need to wake up for, if I have to catch a flight, if I'm excited and I want to wake up early the next day, or if I really need to get something done that I really, really love, or I just want to finish this one last scene of this movie that I'm watching and it's okay if I sleep a little bit later, I prioritize that time all the time. I give that time of sleep and rest to other things. If I really did prioritize God, I'd be okay with giving Him from my time, regardless of what that time comes from. Even if it takes away from my hobbies, if it takes away from my sleep, if it takes away from my rest, the honest to God truth is that I'm not prioritizing God. I mean, beloved, we have to come to this conclusion. We have to be honest with one another and realize that very clearly, while I might think that I love God and I am pursuing a relationship with Him, I don't think there's any other relationship in our lives that would be sustainable if we treated everyone else the way we treat God. Where I tell God, Lord, listen, let me see how much time I have, and if there's any leftover time, I'll give it to you, right? And what does that mean, leftover time? Oh, any time that, you know, that I, I, I was planning on I, doing all of these things. And if there's anything left over at the end of the day, I'll hand it over to you. Can you imagine if I tried to have that same kind of conversation with my wife? Can you imagine a husband and a wife sitting together and having this type of conversation? Where the wife tells the husband, listen, there's tons of stuff that has to be done. But at the end of the day, if I have a couple of minutes, I'll let you know. Maybe we can have a conversation. How is that sustainable? How is that a loving relationship? It's not about I give you from my leftovers. And even then I have to confess to you and tell you that most of us don't even do that well. The reason we don't do it well is because whenever there is an opening in my schedule, I put that time elsewhere. I don't think, oh my goodness, I just gained an hour. Oh my goodness, something just got canceled. I have a couple of hours this evening that are free. I don't tell myself finally some time that I can give God. I don't do that. What do I do? I sit down on the couch, I get in my comfy clothes, I cover myself with a blanket, I open my phone and I start scrolling away. Isn't that what I do? I invest in other things that are absolutely useless to me, that are not edifying. But I don't prioritize God. Imagine if we maintained relationships with other people and dealt with them the same way that we deal with God. It would be heartbreaking, wouldn't it? None of them would remain. They would be broken relationships. But the Lord is patient and the Lord is kind and the Lord understands the weakness of the human being. And so if there is an ounce of laziness within me, I have to correct that. And if there is a lack of love, a lack of prioritizing God, then again, I also must correct that. I must pursue God at every cost. I must run after God and tell Him, Lord, I want you eagerly. I got to tell you, there's this beautiful book in the Old Testament, a book of poetry that's in, filled with incredible symbolism. It's called Song of Solomon. And it talks about this relationship between this man and this woman who are madly in love with each other. And the Shulamite woman, she runs into the streets and she's looking for the one that she loves. And she's stopping people saying, have you seen the one I love? I want to reach that point. I want to reach that point where my soul is eagerly running into the streets and telling people, have you seen the Lord? Have you seen the one that I love? I want to reach a point where I am pursuing him in everything that I do. I don't simply want to tell him, Lord, if I have a free moment, let me see if I can give it to you. That's disgraceful. And unfortunately, my actions demonstrate that I don't love him as much as I should. And I don't do this out of fear that he's upset. I don't do these things and try to correct myself out of fear that maybe he's going to get angry at me, that he might punish me, or that I might have hurt his feelings. My beloved, the Lord is unchanging. His mercy and his love are unconditional. I ought to love him because he's worthy of being loved. I ought to love him because I've tasted the unconditional love that he has for me. And that should be enough fuel. That should be my motivation to pursue him at every cost. I hope that answers the question for the person who submitted it. Um, and I pray that we could all learn to be able to pursue God uh, and to prioritize him in everything that we do.
Josh was asking a question and says, what does Christian discipleship mean to you? And how do you encourage genuine community? What does Christian discipleship mean to you? That's a very good question. Joshua, I think discipleship goes, so a disciple is someone who learns, right? And obviously a disciple is, is a student. And that's its, its definition. But I think there's a lot more to it than just that. I really do believe that one of the key successes of the apostolic church is the fact that we really do believe in discipleship. And while, while we look around us today, we might think to ourselves, we need to revive the spirit of discipleship. And I agree, I think we do. I have to tell you that this true discipleship is when a person looks at himself and realizes, I need a mentor. I need someone to coach me. I need someone who will show me the way. I need to look at those who came before me and walk in their footsteps. I need to hide behind giants. And this is why you'll notice that at the very least in the Orthodox Church, every member of the body of Christ has a father of confession. We must all confess, not only the laity, from the little children to the parents, to the elderly, to the deacons, to the clergy members who are priests, who are bishops, and even our Holy Father, the Patriarch, has a father of confession. You have to keep this in mind and ask yourself, why is that? It's not just because they're going to participate in the mystery. It's also because every one of us needs spiritual counseling. I am the truest and most sincerest enemy I have. A sincere enemy. What do I mean by sincere enemy? I mean, it's in my face obvious that I am my worst enemy. I am the person who has lied to myself the most. I am the person who's made the most promises to myself and broken them. I am the person who is supposed to have my back all the time and look out for my best interests, but I'm constantly getting myself in trouble. And so I need someone who is outside of me, who cares for me, who loves me, who wants to lead me to salvation, to then guide me and help me and call me out if I need to be called out. So discipleship is this relationship of mentorship. Discipleship is when a person is capable of looking at another and telling them, let me give to you what has been given to me. And this is what we call tradition. The Greek word for tradition is paradisos, this idea of the handing down of something. It's almost as if, you know, the relay races that we see, how it is that a person's carrying a baton and he's running after another and he's handing it over to that next person. The next person takes it and he runs and he brings it to another this is the spirit of discipleship, where what has been handed down to us, we hand down to another. We don't give of ourselves. God forbid that I should ever disciple anyone so they can look like me. That won't lead them to anything. If anything, it might lead them to complete spiritual decay. What I want to do is to be able to give them from the image of God that has been granted to me. I want to be able to give them from the beautiful teaching of the church that was entrusted to me. And so we ought to all be disciples. We ought to all pursue a person who will teach us, guide us, counsel us, and that we are capable of learning from them and mimicking, mimicking them in the spiritual life for the sake of growth. As far as how do you encourage genuine community, I think the commandment is clear. I mean, all of Christianity can be summarized in love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself, right? It has to begin at the level of love. And I have to tell you, I think sometimes we overcomplicate it. I think we focus so much on the social aspect of community. We come together, we share a meal, we do things together. There are activities, there's communal prayer times. And I think those are wonderful things. But while I believe those things are very important and very good, I also believe that there's just, you know, the simplest aspect of love is oftentimes missing in our communities. Love in the sense where I actually care for the person next to me. I might not even know their name. But if I find out that this person is suffering, my heart should break. My heart should break for them and I, I should want to love them and I should want to go to them and embrace them and tell them I'm praying for you. Even if I don't know anything about this person at the level of who they are, where they came from, what they do, I want to be able to reach a point where my love for them really sees them as a member of the same body. And by loving them, I've loved myself and by loving them, I've loved my God. We have to reach a point where we can genuinely like create this, this, this spirit of love within us or between us we have to reach a point where i can look at another person and when they are happy i rejoice and when they are sad i mourn with them the same way that saint paul makes it very clear about the members of the body where one suffers they all suffer we're all when one is glorified all rejoice we have to do those things i would encourage genuine community at the level of asking about each other creating opportunities for us to be able to love one another to mourn with each other to support one another uh, even if it means 
the, in the smallest actions. If there is a family who is expecting and the mother is pregnant, as soon as she gives birth, a few of us should come together and offer uh, you know, frozen foods for them to be able to, 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 to have meals that they can simply place in the oven and get it done with. If I find out that there is a couple uh, that they, they've been struggling for quite a while and they never have any time, I should offer to go babysit their children and be with them so they can have the night off. If there is an elderly couple that it's been a while since they, 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 they've been taken out and shown around, let me, let me offer to take them out and to take them to a restaurant and pay for their meal. If there is a person who is struggling, let, let me go and give them encouragement. Let me motivate them. Let me remember them. If there are students who are staying in the, on campuses where they don't have the opportunities to celebrate with their families because they're at a distance. Let me invite them to my house. Let them know that they have a family member who cares for them, that they have an extension of their home here. All of these things are ways that we can love each other in the simplest of ways. And even if it just means smiling at one another, even if it means just asking people sincerely, how was your day? And then paying attention, listening to what they're saying. All of these things can create a true community. Uh, but unfortunately, what oftentimes happens is that we're so self-absorbed, we're, we're consumed, right? We have to break away from that. We have to create these opportunities for us to truly love one another. Um, but we're so busy putting each other in boxes. And forgive me, I'm going to be a little bit provocative. Like we're so good at saying boxes like, oh, he's a newcomer. Oh, he's a fob. Oh, he's a this. Oh, he's a that. She's a this. She just came in. Oh, uh, that's, that's the woman whose son is so uh, rowdy. Oh, and that's the child who broke that thing in Sunday school the other day. We're so busy remembering each other with these tags and placing each other in these boxes. It's useless. It's useless. The person that, 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 that you are categorizing or placing in a box or name tagging is a person who needs love, who needs to see Christ. And he won't see Christ unless you become an icon of him. And so community is when you have these mini Christs going around everywhere. That's, that's exactly what Christian means, by the way. Christianos literally means just a mini Christ, right? If Imagine a community where we have mini Christs running around everywhere, loving each other, caring about each other, asking about each other. Imagine what that would look like. I, I think we could change the entire world. I really do. But if only if we begin with offering a sincere repentance. My beloved, just again, it's almost 12.30, but if there are any more questions, we'd be happy to take them, um, to take them live. Um, if not, I'll go ahead and answer one last question here. Um, from the questions that we have received. There's a person who says, I'm constantly struggling with reading the Bible. Um, what tips can you give for a beginner? Very good question, Habibi. Uh, as, as far as scripture, we need to understand, you know, script, scripture has always been explained to me as, you know, the food that fuels the soul. My father's confession used to tell me all the time, unless you feed the soul, do not feed the body. He used to literally tell me, if you have not read your Bible, don't eat. The reason for that was to remind me that here I am caring so much about how much I fuel my body, how much I feed my body, but I'm not feeding my soul. The other example I want us to keep in mind, an image that was very provocative to me, was this idea of imagine a dialogue that exists between two people. A dialogue where a person, for instance, calls me on my phone, and when they call me, they say, Hi, Abuna, I had a quick question for you. I really need your advice on X, Y, and Z. And after the person explains it to me and he says, Abuna, I really wanted to know what your thoughts are. Uh, what do you think I should do? And the moment they think, they say, what do you think I should do? They immediately hang up and I don't have a chance to answer. And so they call back the next day and they're like, hey, Abuna, like yesterday, um, uh, I'm not sure, really sure what happened there, but like I called and I asked those questions to you and I wanted to know um, what are your thoughts on this? Really not sure what happened, but I didn't hear from you. Um, what's going on? Do you have time to answer me? And then they hang up. And again, I don't have a chance to answer. So they called the third day, but this time they're a little bit upset. Like, Abuna, you know, it's been twice. Like, if you don't have time, just tell me you don't have time. I get it. But like, Abuna, this is really important to me. I really want to know your thoughts. Please, like, if you can make an effort, tell me what's going on. And then they hang up. So now it's been three consecutive times that they keep asking, and they're getting more and more annoyed, and they're building resentment, but they keep hanging up, and I never have a chance to answer them. And then finally, the fourth time they call and they say, you know what, Abuna, this is not working. Forget it. I'm even sorry I even bothered you. Clearly, you don't care. You're not answering me. You're completely ignoring me. And again, they hang up. I sometimes feel like we treat God in the exact same way. We go to God in prayer. We talk about all our problems. We say everything that's happening. We ask God a whole bunch of questions. We ask Him for His will, this and that. And then what do we do? We hang up. 
What do we mean by we hang up? I don't search out his word. I don't crack open scripture. I don't give him the opportunity to answer me. How else will God answer me if I am not making myself acquainted to his word? If I'm not reading it, if I'm not investing in understanding the mind of the Holy Spirit as it inspired all of those authors over the centuries to write the word of God. Scripture to us is the means by which we can understand how it is that God functions. How would he would have us deal with situations where we learn from the examples of those who came before us, those men and those women who walked holy paths and they pursued God in everything that they did. If I am not cracking open scripture, if I am not learning the word of God, how am I giving God the opportunity to answer me? Then there's no difference between me and that person who calls, complains and hangs up and then says, why aren't you answering me? How many times have I said, I feel like, God has abandoned me. I feel like God is going silent. I feel like he's not answering me. I feel like God has distanced himself. And I say all of those things, but I'm not cracking open his word. I'm not pursuing him. My beloved, I want us to see scripture in that way. I want us to realize that scripture really is the means by which we can pursue God so we can understand his mind. After I say my questions and I bring my problems to him in prayer, crack open scripture. Have a spiritual rule. Go to your fathers of confession. Tell them, how much should I be reading? If it's half a chapter, it's half a chapter. If it's 10 verses, it's 10 verses. If it's five chapters, whatever my spiritual canon is. But I should be reading with interest, not simply reading when I'm... Comp- like, I-, I love it when people tell me, Abuna, I try to read the Bible right before I go to bed. How about me? That's a horrible time to read the Bible. Well, at-, at least for most of us. For me, it is for sure. Because by the time I get to my bedroom, all I really want to do is crash. I am not in the mindset to sit there and be focused and to take in the word of God. That is not the right time for me to try to focus on anything. By the time I get to my bedroom, my bedroom and my bed are usually the perfect indication of how it is that I'm going to reach a point where I'm going to crash. So this is not the right time for me to say I want to focus on God's word. So if I am going to read God's word, it's got to be at a time that is fitting for me to focus, for me to be able to receive his word. For some people, it's before they eat. For some people, it's right in the morning. For some people, it's in their car. It doesn't matter where it is. But find a time where you are focused so you can take in the word of God. And tell yourself, if I have not fed the body, I will not feed the soul. Thank you to the person who asked that question. That is a question that applies to very, very many of us. So thank you for asking that. We have another question from Sabu that says, did any Orthodox Church fathers taught universal reconciliation? Yes, there there were. There were a few of them who hinted at the idea of uh, of universal reconciliation. Um, St. Isaac the Syrian hinted at it. Gregory of Nyssa hinted at it as well. Uh, We know that uh, that St. Augustine also spoke of it. Well, my beloved, here, here's the thing, right? If we're going to speak about what the church calls apocatastasis, this universal hope of everyone being saved, uh, because it is not widely seen in the church, we don't preach it. And we definitely, we definitely um, don't believe in this idea of you could do whatever you want, and in the end, you know, God is going to reconcile everyone to each other. So this idea of universal salvation, while we might hear of it in certain Um, in certain letters or in certain commentaries of some early church fathers, there is a much larger body of work that clearly demonstrate that, you know, I must work out my salvation with fear and trembling. I must do everything that I have to do right now to align my will to God's, to offer myself to God, to be united to him in this life. Um, And so here's something that you need to understand. We pray for it. We pray for all of creation to be saved. We want every aspect of God's creation to be saved. Every person created in his image and likeness, we pray for their salvation. We really do. We pray for our friends and our foes, for the people that we love and for our enemies. We pray for all of creation to come into the presence of God. But do we hope in it and bet on it as if this is guaranteed? No, absolutely not. We don't. And so while some people might have spoken about it, in a spirit of hope, knowing and understanding God's love and mercy, we will not build our spiritual life around that. I will build my spiritual life as to how it was handed down to me, where I know that I have a responsibility to work with God in synergy, where I must cooperate with Him, where I have my faith, but I also must demonstrate that faith in my works. Both of these things together can allow God to work in me. Sabu Habib, I hope that answers your question. 
We have one last question from Peter who says, did God's standard of morality change from the Old Testament to the New Testament? For example, why was it that someone like Judith could use lying to save the Israelites? Peter, very good question, Habib. We definitely believe that God is never changing, right? We say he's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is unchanging. He is the same yesterday, today and forever. We really do believe those things about the Lord. But what you must understand is that sometimes we mistake God's essence for the way that he expresses it. It's not so much God that has changed, but it is how he deals with us that is progressing. So when you notice that there are discrepancies between the Old and the New Testament, I want you to consider the following. Humanity sometimes is described as one human being who is going through like this growth process. He goes from infancy to full maturity. And so as humanity was very immature and young in the Old Testament, the Lord deals with them in standards that are black and white. He deals with them with, this is wrong, this is kocha, you don't touch this, you don't do that. Right? And he speaks to us truly as if we were children. He does not try to build the intellect at the level where he knows that they're not capable of receiving it. Because they have not received grace yet, because they haven't seen the incarnate Lord, because they don't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the Lord deals with humanity at the level where they are at. And he uses their means, he uses their standards to be able to relate to them. Because to enforce his own on them, they would completely miss it. But he's slowly calling them out of this darkness. And this is why you'll notice that Christ himself is capable of saying in the New Testament, you have heard it said of old that you shall not do X, Y, and Z. But now I tell you this, this, and this. For example, he says, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, turn the other cheek. Walk the second mile. Give the second cloak. He talks about this in a way where he's pulling us towards a greater grace. He's pulling us towards growth. Now, is that enough for us to say that the Lord has changed? No, it isn't the Lord who has changed. But he is dealing with us as we mature. And so humanity has changed dramatically from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And it's because of this now that we who have received grace, who have received adoption and baptism, who have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, who have the Holy Church in her teachings, who have access to all of these things, we are called to a very different level. We are called to a level where we know and understand things that many people did not before. This is why in the litany of the gospel, what do we say? For many prophets and righteous men have desired to see the things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear the things which you hear and have not heard them. But as for you, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. He's speaking to us because we have access to all of these mysteries that have been unfolded, that have been revealed to us. And so we must work with the grace that has been given to us. But as for those of the time of old, the Lord was treating them at the level where they were very young, if you wish, still within their infancy. I think here's one last example I'll give you to try to make this point clear. When my children are very young, very, very young, if they come near the oven, and it's hot, and I don't want them to place their hand right up against the window of the oven. I tell them, no, Habibi, no, this is bad, this is hot, no, kuch, right? And I speak to them in language that they can understand. I don't sit there and try to explain to the two-year-old who just learned to walk and tell them, you see, Habibi, it's because it's so hot, and you actually have many different layers of skin, and what can happen is that if you stick your hand onto something that's very hot, you can actually burn the first... I don't go through all of those details. I don't explain these things. It's as simple as saying what? Kuch. Don't do that. And if you do it, it's going to be bad. And so while they might think, I don't want to do this to upset mom or dad, in reality, the reason I gave them that command is because I'm worried for them. And so while you might have seen the standard in the Old Testament be at that level, no, koch, don't, in the New Testament, you have an unraveling of so much wisdom, of so much beauty, and obviously of teaching the people why it is that they should align their will to God's. Peter Habibi, I hope. That answers your question just a little bit. My beloved, I've, I've gone over my half an hour. Time always flies when we're together. Uh, it's always so pleasant to spend time with you guys and to answer your questions and to learn from so many of the questions that you guys have submitted to us. I can't thank you guys enough for your encouragement and your participation. Uh, I can't tell you how much uh, we're encouraged by how much you guys are participating on these live Q&As and sending us questions on a regular basis. We urge you, please, if you have not made yourself familiar with the website or the YouTube channel, 
please make yourself familiar. Go through the video list. See if there's anything there that might be of interest to you. If you are a Sunday school teacher that believes that some of these things could be uh, worthwhile for your kids to hear about, please share them. The whole purpose is for us to share the wealth and the beauty of the church, not to promote ourselves. I pray that you understand that. We don't care about people... Uh, liking us specifically as much as we want people to see how beautiful our faith is, how rich and how wealthy our mother the church is. And so because we're so proud of our Orthodox tradition, because we're so proud of being Orthodox Christians, we want to share the wealth of that. If you feel that anybody can benefit, please share the content, invite others to come and take a look, and at the same time continue praying for us so that God may continue to bless the ministry that he set before us. God bless you. Please remember us in our prayers, and to God be our, player, to our, God be our glory now and forever. And unto the ages of all ages, amen.